Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Autumn is Here. I'm Francine Crawford, your host. And tonight we're going to speak to a doctor, and he's going to tell us a little bit about trying to prepare for our senior years or preparing just for anything medical, things that we don't look, we don't look for, we need to know about, and just to be prepared and so we can have a better quality of life. So let's welcome out to our show, Dr. Ase Tutu. Welcome. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, your profession and how long you've been in this profession? Okay. So, uh, my background is internal medicine. And, you know, I finished my training back in 1987. So I've been in practice for a while. And about four years ago, I became, you know, um, are, are certified in addiction medicine. So my internal medicine is my specialty. Mm -hmm. I have addiction medicine as a sub-specialty. Sub you know. Oh, okay. Addiction medicine. Okay. Right. Under the ages of the American uh, uh, Board of Preventive Medicine. Okay. It's in Chicago. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, you've been practicing for a long time. That's correct. Okay, well, you know that my, my show is about having a better quality of life. Sometimes mm -hmm. we don't think about it until it's um, it's too late or that we have a sickness and then we want to know um, how to deal with it as opposed to trying to prevent certain things mm -hmm. um, and trying to look out for certain. Sometimes you don't even know what to look for. Yeah, so we, we would like to, you know, just get into some um, common things maybe that uh, people need to know that will help them have a better quality of life, especially as they age and grow and into their senior years. Okay. So, you know, I'm going to start by, you know, talking about a few things. Okay. Like everything in medicine, you always have to go to the root cause of a problem mm -hmm. to be able to effectively deal with it. So that's number one. Number two is, if there is no problem, then you don't have to deal with it, right? So, so you know, I mean, like when I was working in the hospital, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning, I'll be brainstorming, thinking about, you know, did I do this for the patient in the ICU? Did I forget? In other words, I'm always troubleshooting um. because I don't want to be caught in an emergency situation. So I try to, you know, uh, cross all my T's and dot all my eyes. Right. And if you do that effectively, you can prevent a whole host of problems. So preventive medicine, you know, if folks do not get anything out of this conversation tonight, preventive medicine is the key to everything. Once the horse is out of the barn, <laughs> it's too late. Okay. So try to prevent diseases before they occur. What do I mean by that? For instance, if you look uh, in the general population, certain medical conditions are prevalent, such as high blood pressure, sure. diabetes, high cholesterol, mm. you know, family history, obesity, and uh, nicotine addiction. Mm. These constellation of uh, medical problems, if you take them in total, okay, these are the conditions that will predispose you for, for instance, getting a heart attack, mm. getting a stroke, getting kidney failure, mm. uh, getting circulation problems that may lead to amputation, mm. getting blind, you know, so all these, you know, when you see somebody on dialysis, right. it's not something that happened, you know, today or yesterday. It's been, you know, the, the, the groundwork has been laid for over years, and then eventually everything coalesces, and then boom. You're on dialysis machine, or you are looking for a transplant. Mm. What we believe is this: you know, if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, 
If you have high cholesterol, you smoke cigarettes, you are obese, you have a sedentary lifestyle, i.e. couch potato, okay? The more of these things you have, the more the likelihood that you may, you could get a heart attack, you could get a stroke, you may wind up on dialysis. So in order to prevent these sequela or these complications, you have to take care of the fundamentals. Okay. Right? So if you have high blood pressure, it's not enough to see a doctor, they give you medication, and you know, some days you take it, some days you don't take it. Oh, because I feel fine, so I don't think I need to take it. No, 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 no. Okay. High blood pressure is a silent killer. Mm. A lot of times you don't have any symptoms. Rarely you may get a headache or whatever. But by and large, most people with high blood pressure feel fine. They are normal. Mm. However, that elevated blood pressure is wreaking havoc unbeknownst to you. Mm. It's putting too much demand on your heart so that the heart has to work extra hard to be able to overcome that resistance to pump the blood downstream. Okay. And the heart usually will compensate by you know, thickening the muscles that is required to pump the blood. So you get what is called uh, ventricular hypertrophy, which is a layman, uh, medical term for thickening of the heart muscle. Mm. Because in order to be able to generate enough force to overcome the resistance, you need more power. And more power is the heart thickening maybe two or three times its regular thickness. Mm. That will go on for a while. Eventually, the heart is going to get tired or weak. And when that happens, that's heart failure. Mm. Okay. And fluid then is going to start backing up into your lungs, mm. and then you walk from here to there, you are huffing and puffing. Mm. You are always short of breath, you feel tired, you feel fatigued. And sometimes in severe cases, you cannot even lie flat on your back. You have to sleep sitting up. Mm. Wow. Had you taken good care of the high blood pressure, you wouldn't have wound up having heart failure. So that's why it's very, very, very important. And when you see a doctor with high blood, if you have a high blood pressure and you see a, a doctor, there are plethora of blood pressure medications that we can use. Mm -hmm. But based on what the clinical features that the patient present with, certain blood pressure medications may be better than others. So it's not like one size, one size fits all. You have to tailor your medications specifically Right. to what is in front of you. Now, I would like to pontificate on this. Okay, It's not enough to see a doctor, get a medication, and then you know, don't see the doctor again. Mm. When we start you on blood pressure medications, usually we, you know, we, we don't want to give you such a high dose from the outset to bottom you down. That's, that's not good. That, that's the tremendous. So we'll start you somewhere. And then over time, based on your blood pressure readings, titrate or increase the medication gradually until we get you to a, a place where your blood pressure is under good control. Oftentimes, patients will come in, they get their blood pressure medication, and they don't see the doctor again. Sometimes it's because, especially with male patients, a lot of these blood pressure medications can cause problem with erection. That's a major, 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 major problem. Okay. And sometimes when the patients complain to the doctor about it, they may be dismissive. So you really have to listen to your patients mm -hmm. and work with them because there are so many blood pressure medications out there and you could find one that will not have that unpleasant side effect. So that's high blood pressure. 
Is there anything that you can do? Like once you find out you have high blood pressure, you go to the doctor, they evaluate you, they give you better medication and say if this medication does work for you, is there anything else that you should be doing also? Like you just don't just take the medicine and say, I have high blood pressure, this will, this will fix it. Yeah. What else can you do yourself? That's, that's a very important point, Francine. <laughs> and when you are taking an exam, and you, you tell your patient has a high blood pressure and the first thing what would you do and the first thing you say is pill <laughs> you are probably going to get a nerve you know lifestyle modica- modification is very important okay okay but lifestyle modification meaning when you exercise right exercise treadmill mm-hmm. when you exercise your blood pressure comes down oh, okay. yes okay your blood pressure comes down. And I'm not going to be technical, but usually your blood pressure, if you really want to go to the basics, okay, your blood pressure, I'm not, no, your heart rate, your blood pressure is proportional to your heart rate. Let me keep it simple, okay? So the higher your heart rate is, the higher your blood pressure is going to be, everything being equal. So we have medications that would like slow down your heart rate because when the heart rate is down, your blood pressure comes down. Exercise does that. Anybody who is a seasoned athlete will have low pulse rate. That will bring your blood pressure down. So I'm very glad that you mentioned that. You know, even before you start with the medication, you know, it depends. The patient is coming in with borderline blood pressure elevation then you have time, right? Right, But if the patient is staring at you with a blood pressure of 260 over 180, <laughs> they have to be on medications right away, right? Yeah. So, but usually weight reduction, mm-hmm. especially the bottom blood pressure, the diastolic, the diastolic blood pressure is a function of your weight. Mm-hmm. If you're obese or heavy, Usually the diastolic blood pressure will be high. So weight reduction is very, very, very important. And you achieve that by eating less calories, Mm -hmm. exercising. Those are the two major ingredients. If you exercise and you eat less amount of calories than you are, I mean, less than what you are using to maintain that, eating to maintain that weight, you know, you are going to lose weight. And with the weight loss, once you lose weight also, it helps with your cholesterol a lot of times. Okay. So that's very, very, very important. And then cigarette smoking, you have to quit. Yeah. You have to quit cigarette smoking because these are what we call the risk factors for uh, cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular meaning stroke, heart attack, Mm -hmm. kidney problems, okay. And... The major ones are high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, cigarette smoking, and family history. Usually the family history, if your you know, uh, father or brother had a heart attack or stroke before the age of uh, 55, mm-hmm. it's a strike against you. Mm-hmm. It counts against you. If a, a, a mother or first degree female relative had a heart attack or stroke before the age of 65, it's a strike against you. So the more of these things that you have in your background, the more the likelihood that you may get a heart attack or stroke or kidney problem. Yeah. And the less of these that you have, whether you do it through you know controlling your blood pressure with medications, lifestyle, whatever, controlling your blood sugars with medication, lifestyle, or whatever, uh, quitting smoking, controlling your cholesterol with medication or lifestyle medication. As you lower your risk factors, your risk for getting any of these things also goes down. Okay. Great, great. Okay, well, that's good to know that it's not it's not over. Like, you yes. know you can do some things that will at least eliminate some of the, maybe the pills will take a lower dose or something like that. So, so that's great to know that. So is there any, um, what about, I I know that diabetes is uh, uh, very common, very Uh common. 
um, in in our neighborhoods and families and stuff like that. And it seems like if if that's something seems like if something is if that's in your family, you know, some people get it early on. They don't wait. It doesn't wait till you get, you know, 50, 60. Some people have it early on. Um, how do we uh, avoid that? How do we ch- try to, you know. Let me comment on that. That's a very good point. OK, so there are two types of diabetes. OK. Right. There's a type one and a type two. Mm-hmm. Usually type one occurs much, much, much early on. Okay, much, much. Sometimes it even occurs in, in utero while you know your mother is pregnant with you. Mm. And what happens then is, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, as a result of a viral infection or something called antibodies, mm-hmm. this, this viral infection or antibody will be directed against the insulin producing area of your pancreas, okay? And destroy it. So once the insulin producing area of your pancreas is destroyed, then you cannot make insulin whatsoever. Okay, that's the type one. You see, your your pancreas, there are two, two, main portions of your pancreas. There's what we call the exocrine pancreas. Exocrine pancreas is what helps you digest uh, meat, protein, right? There are enzymes that the pancreas will make. And these enzymes will help help with digestion, like protein, uh, uh, fat, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The other side is the endocrine side. The endocrine side is what controls your sugar, you know, in a layman's term. Okay. So people with type 1 diabetes early on in life, for whatever reasons, and I could give you a myriad of them, I don't think that would be proper for this type of discussion. For whatever, for whatever reason, your pancreas, the insulin producing part of the pancreas becomes destroyed. So they cannot make insulin. And that's type one. These people require insulin for the rest of their lives. The only way that you can circumvent that is is if you give them pancreatic transplant, the area of the, the area that makes insulin, somebody dies, you can harvest it and transplant it too. Mm. Once you do that, they are going to be making insulin, and then the diabetes type one diabetes dis- disappears. Okay. Okay. So that's type one. But if type one patients usually are skinny. They are thin. They can go into this condition called diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a medical emergency. If they do not take insulin. Mm. Their insulin can go up a little bit, and then their their blood start to turn acidic, like acid. And usually, these people are treated in the intensive care unit. You give them fluids, you give them insulin drip, the whole nine years. Okay, so that's type one. And until the day they die, they are going to need insulin. If you do not know, and you give somebody with type one diabetes sugar pill, you are going to kill them. Wow. Yes. They need insulin. Mm. Period. Mm -hmm. Now, the type two, the type two is what you see in adults. But these days, we are even seeing it in younger people because of obesity. Mm. The type two is strongly correlated with obesity. Okay. And usually the type two, there are more people with type two diabetes than there are with type one. The type two diabetes has a strong genetic predisposition. In other words, if you have two identical twins and one of them develops type two diabetes, Mm -hmm. the other one almost 100% certainty 
that they also get type 2 diabetes. Unless you know, they do the lifestyle modification, lose weight, da 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 da. Usually, people with type 2 diabetes, unlike their type 1 counterparts, make excessive amount of insulin. They produce too much insulin. The problem is because of the obesity, the insulin cannot, you know, the sugar that is inside your blood vessels do not belong there. They have to cross the blood vessel and get into your flesh where it's needed for fuel. Mm. So if you have a lot of sugar stagnated within your blood vessels and it's not getting out to the flesh, your flesh is starving. In the midst of plenty, you have a lot of sugar inside the, in your bloodstream, but they are not crossing to go to the flesh to be used as fuel. It's like being in the ocean. Okay. You are very thirsty. There's water everywhere, but you cannot drink it, right? Yeah. Same thing. So the sugar in the, in the blood vessels have to cross the blood vessels, get into your flesh, so the flesh can use it for fuel, okay? okay. So um, people with type 2 diabetes, the, uh, they have a lot of sugar inside the blood vessels, but you have to open the lock the flesh lock, right? So that the sugar can get in. And when somebody's obese, then, you know, the receptor insulin is trying to get in, but it keeps missing. You cannot find the, the, the lock. So once you lose weight with exercise and everything, all of a sudden, things become efficient. The sugar leaves your bloodstream into your flesh and, you know, you, you know blood sugar goes down. So um, type 2 diabetes, the cornerstone of management is exercise and weight reduction. If you do that very, very well, mm -hmm. you can get rid of the diabetes. Mm -hmm. And in my practice, I've seen it. I've had patients come in, they saw somebody, they loaded them with you know, insulin. Usually what happens is you can even, you know, see the trajectory. They go in, they start them on sugar pills, right? The sugar pill, every medication has the maximum dose that you can take, right? So if say the sugar pill, the most you can take is 20 milligrams. Mm -hmm. Once the person reaches 20 milligrams, you cannot go up anymore. Mm -hmm. So you have to add maybe a, another sugar pill that works by a different mechanism to try to bring the sugar down. Okay. But then they, they are on that sugar is still high, you keep going up, going, and going. Up. Once they, they, they are getting ready to go on a third pill, you have to switch them to insulin. Or you can do both. Okay. But the problem insulin is a double edged sword. If the person does not need insulin, you don't want to put them in ins on insulin because insulin will make you gain weight. Oh, really? Okay. And when you gain weight, your blood sugars go up. That's right. So you have to increase the insulin. You gain more weight. So it's uh, like you're going to be chasing the dog. <laughs> you don't yeah. want to do that. Right? So the, 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 the cornerstone of treating somebody with type 2 diabetes, you know, emphasize to the patient to try to get to their ideal body weight, you know, based on your height and your build. We can calculate what your ideal body weight should be and commensurate with that how many calories you need to eat a day to try to get. So if you do that very, very, very well mm -hmm. with exercise, a lot of times you can get rid of the type uh, 2 diabetes. And you don't want to play footsie with diabetes, all right? You don't because, because everything... Diabetes wreaks is havoc by destroying your blood vessels, yeah. right? Everything in your body needs nutrients, mm -hmm. oxygen, whatever, 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 whatever. If you destroy the pipes because you have diabetes that is out of control, which it will do that. It will just destroy your blood vessels. Then you cannot carry the nutrients to the areas where it's needed. So as a result of that, you can get gangrene mm. because 
of the of the lower extremities because the you know nutrients are not getting there. That may require amputation. If you look at the kidney, the kidney is nothing but blood vessels, blood, like five million in each kidney. Mm. And being that diabetes targets blood vessels, is it any wonder that anybody with diabetes that is has not controlled it very well? Usually, ten years of poor control, your kidney is going to be affected. Okay. okay. Same way, because of blood vessel destruction, you know, coronary artery disease, right? And you get a heart attack. Same with stroke. Same in men who cannot get a, a, an erection because erection, you need good blood flow with the penis and diabetes will do that. Diabetes will also cause you to get blind, mm. right? Because um, different mechanisms, but Every every nerve in the body has a blood vessel running next to it. Why? So the nutrients can get into the nerve to feed the nerve. Okay. okay. So if the blood vessels are shut, the nerves are not going to be, so then you start getting like paresthesias or pins and needle sensation in the leg if you have diabetes and in the hands. All right. Because there's no, and then if you look at the eye, I'm looking at you now, right? Mm -hmm. And all I'm seeing is light. The light goes through the eyes. It goes to the the back of the brain, which is where the uh, computer is. Mm -hmm. And then the computer, God is amazing. Computer synthesizes everything and presents it to me as this beautiful lady called Rasin with a long hair, and, you know. But uh, what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing when I'm looking at you is light. Light, right? But, so, in the back, in the back of the of, of, of the somewhere right behind the eye, mm -hmm. there's the optic nerve, right? The optic nerve, the light travels on the optic nerve, and then it goes to the occipital lobe, which is in the back of the brain, there's an area designated for vision. Okay. And that area then interprets the light as an image. So yeah. along the way, from the front of the eye to the retina, which is a, uh, like a, a screen you know, in the back of the eye, right? Okay. okay. And then behind it, all the way to the occipital cortex, which is where the computer is. Any interruption along that path could lead to blindness. Mm. So diabetes, is, if it's not under good control, you can develop cataract, right? Mm -hmm. And cataract is opacification of the lens. The lens becomes cloudy and light cannot penetrate, so you can get blind, but that's easy to treat. You just go in the socket. If the blood vessels are not, under, if the blood vessels are not under control, you develop abnormal blood vessels on the screen behind the eye, and when they bleed, they cloud the screen so the light cannot penetrate to get to the brain. Okay. So that's another level of blindness. Wow, wow, that's a lot. So I'm just grateful that you had time and you took time to um, come out here and just give us some information that is all very useful. And I'm um, sure people will be able to, to help. It will be able to help some people. And um, I just want to say to the audience, if you're not uh, in these categories or things like that, if you know somebody else, just share it, share the information, um, share, especially with your loved ones, share with someone that you might, you know, might think it, um, needs extra help. So give the information out. We don't want to keep it to ourselves. So thank you again, um, Dr. Ose Tutu. And I want you to just know that I appreciate you taking the time out and giving us this information. I really do. So thank you for being a part of the show. And, you know, I would maybe the next time, you know, maybe we can de uh, devote maybe five minutes of the segment if anybody has a question, you know, about anything. Okay. You know, or something that is not clear to them, you know, either we saw their doctor, you know, you know, I'd like to be able uh, for us to be able to you know answer you know, two questions. You know. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And until next time, this is autumn is here. We're, t- we're talking about the autumn of our lives. That we all are going to get older. Um, if you're 40, 50, whatever, if you're blessed, you get older and your life will change. Your body will change and you need to have the information that will help you have a better quality of life. So thank you again. Healthy nutrition is very important. Eat Health? a balanced diet. Yes. Healthy nutrition, stop smoking. Eat Mediterranean diet, a lot of vegetables, a lot of uh, fruits. Cut, cut, cut back on the meat. Cut back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're talking to me personally. <laughs> I think that was for me. Cut, 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 cut back, you know. <laughs> Eat less calories. Eat less, less calories. calories. Please. Eat less calories, you know. <laughs> and exercise. Exercise. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Good night. God bless. Bye bye. God bless.